Master Your Mindset Radio, Episode 15. Welcome to Master Your Mindset Radio, the show where we empower you to conquer limiting beliefs and transform your world with your gifting and purpose. Now for your host, Elizabeth Nader. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Master Your Mindset Radio. I'm really excited today for the chance to interview a friend of mine. I've known her for a long time. I don't know, over 20 years, I think. Amy Chambadi. Amy, are you there? I'm here. Yay, I'm so glad that we get to talk today. So guys, I wanted you to hear from Amy because she's got a very unusual uh, view on life and mindset and a lot of things based on her experience. She and her husband, David, are pastors and missionaries of a church based in Uganda. So she splits her time between Uganda and the United States. Uh, but we were talking recently about a lot of her experiences in such a different culture. And I thought it would be really cool to explore the mindset differences that she's noticed uh, in the Ugandan culture versus the American culture, especially because she's sort of an aficionado of mindset things and she gets it. So I thought we would have a conversation about that. But first, uh, Amy, do you want to tell us a little bit about the uh, ministry and the church in Uganda that you and David run? Sure. Um, well, hi, everybody. It's great to be with you today. Uh, my husband and I have been on the mission field basically since we married. We married in 2000, and two months later, we took in about 50 uh, street boys and began raising them. We did that for several years uh, with the same group of young men. We also worked with women uh, through other avenues or young girls through other avenues. All of those young men are grown up now and living lives, some here in the States, some in different parts of the world, and some still in Uganda. And then we started a church in uh, 2010, and that's been growing and thriving. We have a young population in our congregation, but they they love the Lord. They love to reach out to people. They do really interesting outreaches. We go into different villages and communities and really just reach people where they're at. So if that means help building a building, if that means digging in a field, if that means peeling potatoes and having conversations, uh, whatever is needed, we just jump in there and just love on people right where they're at. In addition to that, we do conferences and crusades, and uh, our kind of niche, I guess you could say, is in sports events and music events. We do a lot to um, help develop the gospel music industry and the athletic industry in the country. We have two basketball teams, a junior team and a senior team. Be kind of equivalent to our pros, but it's really a developing sport, so it's not quite at that level yet. And then um, the music events, we help to develop the gospel industry there, but also reach out to the community, bringing families together to have fun. And of course, our focus is we want people to know Jesus. So that's a little bit about what we do there. That's our... a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't say that's a little. I'd say that's a lot. You know, it, one of the questions I have is, what is the biggest misconception that Americans have of a place like Uganda? Because, you know, we, we talk a lot about what your experience are like, and I think I have an image in my mind um, from, I don't know, from TV, from movies. I mean, I have yet to have the opportunity to visit there, but I just think, okay, you're a missionary to Uganda. You're a pastor there. Um, I imagine it to be a certain way. And I think a lot of people do. What is the biggest or the few biggest misconceptions that you've run into that Americans have about your adopted country? Uh, one would probably be that everyone is so poor. Hmm. Uh, the picture people, people often get is just what you said through images we've seen, movies we've seen, commercials. The, the idea is that everyone around you is malnourished and babies are, um, you know, skin and bones and nobody can feed their children. Um, while we do have those uh, issues happening in different regions around the whole continent, actually, those, those things are there, but they are not what you see every day unless you're in that specific environment dealing with those specific needs. When you drive through our community, you will see things that look different, like infrastructure-wise, we may not have roads exactly the same. We have more potholes than some areas, but 
we just drove through an area here <laughs> in New Jersey where, you know, there was bad roads. So, or I think we were actually in New York then, but, you know, I mean, everywhere we go, there's potholes, there's, there's, um, you know, poor roads. We have some of that, maybe just a little bit more. We don't have impoverished people everywhere you go, but we do have a much larger population of people who deal with poverty. There's a difference between being completely impoverished and fighting poverty. Mm. So um, like my husband uh, who grew up in Uganda said, you know, I never knew I was really poor until I met Americans. (laughs) <laughs> right, right, exactly. And you until know. you compare and contrast, it's it's a lot of it is relative. So at your church, yeah. you have a mix of people. What what would you say though culturally, from the standpoint of the way people think and the way they look at life, from a mindset standpoint, they may all have different backgrounds. Some have more money than less and different experiences. But what kind of unites people in terms of unique mindsets that you've run into over there that? you didn't grow up with here that are just really strikingly different over there? Uh, One mindset that I absolutely love there um, that I've learned to uh, really enjoy is a more collectivist mindset. African culture is much more collectivist, whereas American culture is much more individualistic. Mm -hmm. There's good and bad things to both, um, but I've just found there's so much beauty in community Um, And of course, there can be stresses in community too, but the idea of the more American me, mine, um, doing it for myself, you know, um, like I once asked my brother-in-law, who's a Ugandan, what his daughter was going to study in college, and he said she was going to study law, and I said, oh, she really likes law, and he looked at me so shocked and said, she likes law? I don't care if she likes law, that's what she's (laughs) going to study. I'm paying for it. That's what she's studying. <laughs> and I'm, that was kind of one of my first like uh, exposures to how different that was because the way I grew up, kids decide what they want to do and and go according to what they love, what their passions are, what their gifts and talents are. And the idea that a parent would force their child to study something in particular was shocking to me, especially if she didn't like it, you know. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't realize is there was such, uh, there's a lot of pressure in some ways that, you know, she needs to pick a career that's going to benefit the family, not just benefit her. And in some ways, we as Americans look at that as kind of a negative thing. She should do what she wants. But she actually went and studied law. She's really good at it and she's very happy. Um, but it's the idea that what I do impacts the community around me. It really isn't just about me and mine. What we do, how we live, we we affect one another. And I've really enjoyed learning that aspect of, of community from that environment. It's made a big difference in my thinking. So there's really almost an expectation there because that example is really good. If she does not have the expectation that our kids would have that, you know, I need to follow my dreams and it's about me, but the expectation is that it matters what her parents think, what her dad wants, and that she's able to give back to the family, then she's not, you're assuming that maybe she's forced to do this, she's not happy, but there isn't this discontent with her choices because she sees them in a broader in a broader way. Whereas if you tell someone over here, you know, you're going to study this because the family's decided that, um, I, I think that would cause quite a ripple effect. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I mean, some people would even consider that almost abusive, right? Like, how could you force them to? Yeah, right, right. So. And, and so I, there's not probably as much pushback. Now you counsel, right. you counsel people a lot. I know you do that naturally, because it's a gift of yours. You coach, you counsel, you listen, you mediate things. So, you know, over there, I know that uh, they look up to you as, uh, as a pastor. Um, you're unique, you're different to them, uh, they enjoy you. So you've talked to a lot of people, you've seen a lot of things. Talk to us about some uh, maybe frustrations with mindsets over there that you've tried to change or things to tried to break off of them that that are limiting, that may be different or, or more intense over there than they are here. Uh, one of the areas, we have a conference that we do every year called Stand Up, Stand Out, and then throughout the year, we go every week to different schools and push that message, uh, you know, preach that message, teach that message that we were all born uh, uniquely um, gifted, 
Uh, we have unique sets of giftings. Even if we have similar gifts as others, they're still unique to us and how we express it or the audience. We get a chance to to embrace or, um, you know, we all have our, our sphere of influence. And so one of the things that's um, human beings, we have a tendency to want to stand out but hide at the same time. Mm -hmm. And in cultures and collectivist cultures, there's pressure to not stand up and stand out. And so that's one aspect where that collectivist culture maybe is a negative that, you know, I'm not going to be able to fulfill the purpose that God created me for and really find my true niche in life and, and enjoy why I'm here if I can't step out and be that unique individual I am and enjoy it, you know, and not be afraid of it. So we really um, encourage people stand up and stand out and be whoever it is God designed you to be. You can still embrace your community. You can still care about your community. You can still use all those gifts and talents to be a great blessing. But we found that just that message alone, it's both delivering but al almost traumatic for some, that some really can't see um, how to come up out of that um, real strong culture of, you know, what if people talk about me? What if people think that I'm... Uh, what do people think that I'm doing this to just show off? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, one time uh, we had a donor come and put in a well. That's a beautiful thing. That's mm -hmm. a wonderful thing to give the community. A, a, it was a well that was already there, but people were spending hours sitting there to to get water, um, to fill their jerry cans with water because it wasn't flowing. So we redid the well, and it's now an artesian well, so you can come get water anytime, and it flows like crazy. And they love it. But people around the community started talking about us, like, who do they think they are? And, you know, why are they trying to show off and impress the community? That had nothing to do with me. We had someone come and say, people need water. We want to provide it. And I didn't think twice. It's a blessing. But there's there's that kind of a negative mentality that I don't I don't want to stand out too much because people are going to talk about me. So this very, the strength of the mentality initially in the community that you enjoyed, like any, anything can have its, its sort of dark side. So the dark side right. is that people have a hard time understanding that they were created uniquely for a purpose because they tend to just get consumed by, by the community side of it. And then there's this sense that people are going to think that um, you know, like you said, that, that I'm focusing on myself or I'm selfish or I think I'm all that. And now uh, some of those messages I hear over here, you know, in the States in terms of sometimes people feeling like they need to shut up and sit down and they don't want to, they don't want to stand out um, for different reasons. Uh, so it sounds like you doing that conference and all of that, you're trying to uh, deftly, carefully begin to pull people out of their shells without disrupting what makes the community unique. And that's, that's gotta be a little challenging. Yes, it is challenging. And, and like you said, I, I think when we look at culture, different parts of the world and everything, one thing we often forget is we all have more in common than we have in different in the sense. I mean, we are different. We, we learn different things, grow up in different ways, but we all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. We all want to have something we feel we've accomplished. We all want to have a community. You know, we have so many uh, deeply rooted things that are in common. The expressions of those things, how they happen, how we're taught to achieve them, those can be different because of our culture and the environment we come from. Mm -hmm. But but I think a key thing when we're looking at um, those communities uh, that we're working with in particular, as you're looking to stand up and stand out, you you're also honoring and valuing the people behind, around you. You're not just saying, hey, this is me, this is who I am, deal with it. You're, you're coming in humbly from the perspective that I'm honored that God made me the way I am and I get a chance to use my gifts and talents to be a blessing to somebody. That's right. an honor, that's a blessing, and however God wants to use that, I'm here to do that. And when you, it's almost like you kind of have to have permission to do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. we, we have a tendency to think we're being proud or conceited to, to own something we're really gifted or good at. Yeah, definitely. And it sometimes makes people feel uncomfortable when you're stepping into who you are because they're not necessarily doing that work. And so I find that to be, I, I think that's kind of universal. You know, I, I, I think that's human nature. And um, if we listen to that, 
we get held back and we start b- believing lies about ourselves and, and we don't walk in the fullness of what we're supposed to be doing because we're concerned about, you know, what people think. But the reverse of it is we're not, as I say, a bull in a china shop and, you know, this is me, deal with it is uh, the extreme sort of unhealthy form of that. So it is lo- learning that balance. And I, I, I don't think that's any different over here. You know, I think that's true here as well. We just aren't rooted in that unique uh, community aspect. So there ha- there has to be, now you're married to a Uganda and it's 19 years tomorrow. Is that yes, your? Yes, tomorrow. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so 19 years of that. And it's, again, I think those people who haven't married someone from a different culture um, take for granted what what you experience. Now, I married someone from a different culture as well. Not quite as extreme as yours because he was living here and he's been in America for a while, but um, think about those early years and, and maybe some of the things, funny and not so funny, but some of the things you learned that you didn't expect, some mindsets that people around you have towards marriage, the roles of men and women. What in all of that stands out to you as unique? Right. Oh, there, <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, the, I want to say too, in, when it comes to, to being married and combining uh, cultures, we all combine some sort of home culture whenever we get married. Good point. But when, but when you marry uh, out of like a first culture, so I, I call my husband and my marriage like we're first culture married, like from different cultures. Whereas there's some, like you said, who may have been born and raised in one country and then gone to another country. And so they're exposed and familiar with the new culture that they're in. Mm -hmm. Um, But there is a difference between the overall culture and the home culture that we each grow up in. So you have actually both of those differences when you have both. So he had the culture he grew up in, which was a single mom. Uh, She raised eight children by herself without much help. She faced a lot of challenges. They went through war. Um, I, my husband saw horrific things growing up, went through terrible, difficult things, but she still managed to provide a good, stable environment for him. And he actually loved and enjoyed his childhood. Um, I grew up in a two parent middle-class family, um, with both parents who loved the Lord and were a part of our lives and, you know, just a great stable family environment. But I actually had more struggles than my husband did with the identity and who I was. But I mean, my cases were from different things, but things that stood out in our marriage that were very culturally different were things like in Ugandan culture, it's very offensive to ask questions. In my culture, both, both the general culture and my home culture, asking questions was one of the ways you communicated. And so we laugh and joke that, you know, my husband used to say, sometimes having a conversation with you is like, you know, having an, being in an interrogation or taking an exam. (laughs) (laughs) So so I was like, okay, well, do you want the true and false exam or the multiple choice exam? (laughs) But this one requires an essay. I'd like a longer explanation. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. To learn how to navigate those things. Like, you know, how do I, how do I communicate without asking as many questions? And then for him, he'd have to say, how do I answer questions? How do I anticipate her questions before so that I just offer information, you know? Yeah. And one deal that we made with each other, too, that I think helped us because we 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 go back and forth between the two places, between the two countries. When we're in uh, my home country, uh, we do things a little bit more my way or my home country way. And when we're in his home country, we do things a little more his home country way. So then we each kind of get a little bit of a, a feel for our life. I mean, for, for what's familiar to us. Right, right. But a, a big thing for us was just learning to talk about a lot of those things. Uh, another thing in the culture that was very different in marriage, typically in American culture, husbands and wives kind of become each other's closest friends and they do a lot of things together. They might socialize together as couples with other couples or or they go out and go to the movies with each other. Um, Ugandan culture is very much, you know, guys hang with guys and ladies hang with ladies and, you know, you do your home stuff at home. Mm. And, um, so that idea of us being buddies, us being close friends and stuff was foreign to him and his idea of go hang out with the ladies and I'll go hang out with the guys. That was very different for me. Right. 
of course, we learn to adjust and adapt. And I think the key thing in every married, uh, every married couple's life or just family lives in general, no matter where you grow up, whatever country or whatever home, you have to decide what your culture is going to be in your house and, um, you know, go before God and decide what things did we each learn and grow up in that were healthy for us, that weren't healthy for us, that we want to pass on, that we don't want to pass on, and then begin to build your life from there. Yeah, I love that. In fact, what you what you said is so true. Sometimes we focus so much on, oh, you married someone from a different culture. What is that like? And like I asked you, but the truth is we marry from different home cultures, no matter where we live. And that in itself, as people are listening to this, you know, who maybe have already gone through those times in their marriage where they had to adjust to each other or are going through that right now. And that in itself can be hard and sometimes traumatic. And you come to the marriage with different views and different mindsets, and it comes from the way you were raised or even a culture. You know, I we live in an area of the country out here where it's heavy Italian. And that culture, even in America, has its own way of showing up in families and in relationships. So I was going to ask you what your best advice is for people. Um, I think you just gave part of it, which is decide together, um, you know, what what your life is going to look like. And it's the melding of the two. Um, so really, any advice you give people is applicable, whether they're here, over overseas, whether they're half and half or whatever that looks like. Right. But I think uh, biblically, we're to prefer one another um, above ourselves. And, you know, the way I treat my spouse reflects really how how much and how well I love myself. Right. And so, yeah, I think a key thing is to be open and honest with one another. Um, You know, come into your relationship. If you're already in it, then stop and, and pause for a minute and look with with honest, open, wide eyes that just say, you know, my family asked these kind of questions. My family talked about this kind of stuff. Where I come from, this is how we deal with stuff. Or this is some people don't even realize they were raised a particular way. So they've never even had those conversations or looked at that stuff. They're just busy trying to figure out how to get along and kind of, you know, are lost in in the shuffle. Yeah. So just stopping and saying, what do I really think? What do I really believe? Um, who taught me that? You say that. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, who taught me that? Who said that? And is this something I want to keep? And when you look at then the two of you after you've both looked at that, which things that you say I want to keep as a part of my life, which things do you have in common and which things don't you? So say I'll just use a simple example, the asking of questions. Um, I can't live my life without asking some questions. That's how I communicate. And <laughs> my yeah. husband can't expect that of me. But I also can't expect my husband to, you know, bend over backwards and 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 just pour out information um, at my demand. That's just not how the two of us communicate. And so we had to learn to give and take. We had to learn to say, this is really vitally important to me, and I don't know how to have a healthy relationship without it. So how how can we both adjust to one another so that we each um, have something that, that we can walk away from, say that, you know, I'm giving in a little bit for you, you're giving in a little bit for me, and then work with that. I mean, that's right. at least the beginning. Right, right. And um, so my request to him was, before you come home, could you anticipate the question you know I'm going to ask, which most likely is going to be, where were you? Or <laughs> who, who were you with? You know, not because I'm questioning your integrity, but because I'm just wanting to talk about your day. And, um, you know, instead of assuming that we're going to have a fight, just assume that we're going to have a great conversation. So that was his work. My work was don't ask the question. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> My work was to wait until you offer the information and just let it begin to happen kind of naturally. And so when I was first learning that, I'd just kind of give him this look and he'd kind of, you know, look at me and I'd be like, do I actually have to ask the question? Or are you going to offer the information? <laughs> <laughs> it's a you standoff. Know? Who's going first? <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and then he'd usually be like, Oh, I forgot, you know, yeah. and then he'd, and then he'd tell me a little something. And then I had to learn to let that be enough. Yeah. And, um, you know, some of those lessons for both of us were real hard, but honestly, it was a really fruitful way for us to let each other be each other. And, 
at the same time challenge each of us to grow. Well, it sounds, it sounds to me like there is a class in there for marriage mindset, a uh, multicultural marriage mindset. I, it sounds to me like you, there's a whole thing there that you could help people with. And uh, yeah, but not just uh, cultural, you know, one country to another, but just the differences that we all experience. So you've been through all of this. I mean, 19 years of living in two different countries, all the things that you've seen and gone through and um, you know, you have an amazing life testimony, which we're not going to talk about today, but we're going to do that sometime. I want people to hear what you have experienced in your life, because I know it will be just an amazing blessing to people who maybe have had some similar things. But if you could go back in time to your younger self, now that you've been through all this and you've made the choices you've made and you've seen what you've seen, and you know, when we're younger, uh, we tend to take on some things and believe some things that aren't true, or we worry about anxious about things that, you know, that really we don't need to be, but that's what we do. If you could go back to your younger self, maybe your teenage self, maybe early 20s, what would you tell her? That's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) Which I should have told you I was going to ask you, but it just occurred to me because I I, I think that you, you have the wisdom um, that someday we'll share with everybody, but a wisdom of having been through so much that that helps you now when you look back, sometimes we can see things more clearly. Of course, we don't have that advantage of going back. You do have a daughter and a son and you'll use that wisdom to help them, but we each have to make our own path and yeah. and we all make mistakes and we all uh, focus on the wrong things or get anxious. I know, you know, yeah. for me, I would tell myself, chill out, it's all gonna work out one step at a time. You know, don't step on the gas, don't worry about it. Um, things like that. Is there anything that comes to mind that you would tell your younger self? I would probably, the, the words that come to mind immediately are, uh, don't be afraid. Stop mm. being afraid. Um, you know, fear, fear really is only debilitating. It's, it's destructive. It really doesn't, it's not fruitful in any positive way. And I battled a lot of fear for a lot of reasons, whether it's fear of failure, fear of succeeding, Yeah. <laughs> fear, you know, uh, my first speech, I fainted in front of my class because I was so afraid to speak. Um, <laughs> and now I speak for a living. So, um, you know, stop being afraid. Be be whoever God's created you to be and and be that person, that, you know, the best that you can. Be that person with excellence. Right. Um, we waste a lot of time in our younger years. I, I, in fact, I think you say it in the book. You talk about how really we buy into a lot as children um, ignorantly. Uh, I know you don't say it that way, but right. um, as, as children, there's a lot we absorb about ourselves, about people, about our environment um, that's often faulty or flawed somehow because of whatever things we've experienced. And and for me, those kinds of things caused a lot of fear um, to just be me. I mean, I thought I was fat and I was so thin and I thought I was so fat. And now that I've put on some weight, I lose five pounds and I feel like I'm, you know, a, a toothpick and I'm not, but, <laughs> you know, but I just, there, there's so many misconceptions we have at those young ages. So, but my biggest one would be I, that I have nothing to fear. There's no fear in love. And when we understand the perfect love of God for us, how deeply and passionately he loves us, we really would not be afraid of anything, not even our own mistakes. I love that because fear is what holds us back from being ourselves too. And I, and I don't know if some of that is what you're facing in Uganda when you try to get people to embrace who they really are. It's really fear behind so many things that we won't do or that we do is driven by fear. And as I talk about in the mind of man, you have two emotions, You know, everything either comes out of fear or it comes out of faith, which you can also say love. And all those feelings that we have and everything that we struggle with, the root is one or the other. And I I don't know how you feel with your kids, but I look at mine and I say, well, guys, you have all this mindset stuff all around you. You have a mom who focuses on this, but yes, it's an advantage to them, but each person has to go through that realization and that path. And each person has to come to a point where they wrestle with that and understand that fear does nothing but hold them back and it's a lie and it's the biggest lie that we ever believe and so I think um, as you and I've talked a lot about the things you experience over there uh, with people we can boil a lot down to fear can't we oh yeah and like you said with our with our children 
Um, it's so funny because we want to rescue them from so much. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, uh, like you say in the book, the one thing you can control is your mind. It, but it's also the one thing no one else can do for you. Yes, yes, you know, yes. I, my children have to learn to discipline their own minds. They have to learn to renew their minds daily. That's something I'm responsible to help teach them how to do that, but they have to decide to do that. I can teach my kids how to make the bed, but if they got to get out of the bed and leave it unkept every morning, that's going to be their life. So um, they, they have to choose that. I was going to say one interesting thing my son said to me recently as we're talking about culture and perception um, that I just thought of. It's kind of a little off topic, but I thought you might be interested in this. Mm -hmm. um, he said, do you realize, Mom, that my generation of mixed children is the first accepted generation of mixed children? Wow. And I just <laughs> thought that was really, really powerful statement. It makes me emotional when I think of it. Wow, that's incredible. You know, I, I never even considered that, but he's right. He's absolutely right. His experience as a mixed child 20 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe even, I don't know, 15 years ago would have been entirely different. Yeah, even in my teen years, dating mixed culturally was fairly frowned upon. So, I mean, that just shows you how much we've grown as a society, as a culture, and, and really begun to embrace each other. I know there's different tensions regarding rela racial things, but... When you look at something like that, like you said, if it was 20 years ago, my child would be saying something different. Yeah. But, and I, you know, and then I asked him, of course, are you comfortable being mixed? Are you, would you trade it? Would you change it if you could? No, I love myself. I think I'm great. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Oh, that's the best thing you could ever say, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome. It'll be fun to see both of them grow up and decide where they believe they're called to live and impact and who they're meant to impact because they've had such unique experiences. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, will you promise me that you'll come back sometime in the next year on I the promise. podcast and you're going to give your testimony, the sure. good, the good, the bad, the ugly, the redeem, the breakthrough, the whole, the whole thing, if you want to, um, that's the best thing I could ever offer. <laughs> it is. Deal. It's the best thing. Never go through something difficult and eventually not share it because what is the if, point? If you go through something difficult and you refuse to share it, if you keep it to yourself, it was wasted pain. Yes. Amen. That is absolutely the truth. And transparency at the right time, at mm -hmm. the right time is what sets people free. So exactly. thank, thank you so much for giving me a little bit of time and uh, we will revisit at some point. And guys, you know, the book is on Amazon, Master Your Mindset, The Master's Way. If you already have it, leave me a review. Let people know what it's done for you. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast every Tuesday morning about 7 a.m. Eastern time. It comes out. Go to my website, elizabethnader.com, and you'll find links to a lot of other things, social media. There's some uh, online training that's going to be coming out and actually looks like I'm going to have Amy and her husband uh, do some testing with that over in Uganda. So our reach is far. We are international and that's what we need to do. Uh, the world is really at our feet when we walk in our purpose. So thanks again, Amy. And uh, yeah, God bless. And guys, we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Master Your Mindset Radio. Before you go, if you want to be part of a free online community of like-minded individuals for support, resources, and inspiration as you conquer your limiting beliefs and pursue your purpose, go to elizabethnader.com slash community. That's elizabethnader.com slash community. Or search for Master Your Mindset Academy private group on Facebook. Looking forward to seeing you online.